Welcome to Screen Crush, I'm Ryan Airy. Zack Snyder's Justice League totally surprised me. After the monumental disaster that was the original Justice League, What is that? Oh, my eyes! We were all shocked to see Snyder's vision live up to the hype. The Snyder Cut was a four hour saga that scratched the big screen Justice League itch that we all had, bringing together some of our favorite DC heroes in a thrilling action adventure. But not every superhero team up flick is all it's cracked up to be. Look no further than one of the most divisive superhero movies ever made, The Eternals. Now, unlike the Snyder Cut, Eternals never managed to live up to its expectations, delivering a wishy washy story with themes and characters that would have been better explored in a long form TV series. I think, though, there's one scene that highlights exactly why the Snyder Cut is this. Awesome! And the Eternals is this. Eh, it was okay. And what was I saying? Oh yeah. But first, let's talk about the similarities between these two movies. Chloe Zhao and Zack Snyder adapt superheroes in a similar way. They both have a bit of an edgier, more mature take and show the audience stunning visuals and darker colors. These movies were both hyped on social media and press outlets leading up to release. The Snyder Cut was anticipated by Snyderverse defenders and haters alike, and early coverage of The Eternals touted this as a unique MCU experience. With sex. <laughs> Both films feature a superhero ensemble including a speedster, a guy that's good with technology, a warrior lady, and a guy who can fly, shoot lasers out of his eyes, and punch really hard. The antagonist of both films is an extraterrestrial threat seeking to use Earth and humanity for their benefit, whether it be Arisham's intention to birth a celestial or Darkseid's quest to turn Earth into apocalypse and obtain the anti-life equation. In order to stop these antagonists, the teams devise complex plans involving advanced technology, like the Mother Boxes or the Unimind. Both of these plans initially fail. Both the Parademons and the Deviants are hordes of alien monsters that try to slow down the protagonists in their journey. And of course, these films both feature CGI heavy climax that showcase our hero's powers. Although, at this point, you could say that about any superhero movie. Hey, person, where's all that plastic doing up? Oh, we're doing renovations right now. In the meantime, I'm gonna play this game. What is it? Oh, this? Uh, this is Game of Thrones Slot Casino. They're the sponsor of this video. Err, what's that? Oh, dude, it is my new obsession. So, I've never really played a slots game before, but I am loving this one. First of all, this is not a gambling game, and you're not playing with real money. This game is a fun way to play through the epic story of Game of Thrones. You get to join a house, conquer the map of Essos or Westeros, and eventually take the Iron Throne. Like, I just went across the Narrow Sea, hashed my first dragon, and then fed it. As I level up, the dragon's going to become more powerful. Err, what did you name the dragon? I named him Douglas. Ah, thanks, person. You're welcome, buddy. And there are dozens of classic Game of Thrones stories you can go through, like Trial by Combat, The Battle of Blackwater Bay, The Siege of Marine, and there are tons of quests to finish and cards to upgrade. But mostly, I just like the gameplay. It's fast, it's easy, you get that little adrenaline spike when you win. Heck yeah. It's also just fun to relive the story of Game of Thrones. So if you're looking for a new game, and even if you haven't seen Game of Thrones yet, I highly recommend Game of Thrones Slot Casino. New players receive 1 million free coins when you sign up. Download it and play your way to the Iron Throne with the link down in the description. But what does the Snyder Cut get so right that the Eternals got so wrong? There are two scenes that are so similar that we can use them as a point of comparison, and that's the final battles in both movies. One of these is a captivating climax featuring the heroes we've come to love in a flamboyant parade of violence, explosions, and slow motion in true Zack Snyder fashion. Here's a brief Justice League recap. One of Darkseid's minions, Steppenwolf, attempts to gather the three mother boxes to form the Unity and turn Earth into their home planet, Apocalypse. This leads Wonder Woman and Batman to put together a team of metahumans to protect the Earth from Darkseid's imminent invasion. After using one of the mother boxes to bring an amnesiac Superman back to life, it's our heroes devise a plan to stop Steppenwolf from creating the Unity. Now the danger here feels imminent. I'm sure there is isn't like a random family to save like in the theatrical cut of the Justice League, but we don't need to see people in danger to care about the stakes of this scene. Sometimes for the audience to be on edge, all you need is the characters to be in true danger, and this danger is exemplified by the chaos on screen. The Parademons swarming like flies and explosions littering the battlefield. The Justice League may be rolling through the Parademons like the Empire through innocent civilians. So, the villagers. But they're being slowed down by the obstacles they face. The parademons damage the Batmobile. <laughs> Cyborg is stopped by Steppenwolf. <laughs> Flash gets injured. <laughs> and Darkseid even wins. 
our heroes have a well-defined purpose and are up against a clear threat. This threat actually frightens the audience because we've spent the entire movie growing connected to these characters. A four-hour film gave Snyder plenty of time to give each character the respect they deserve, and it's a way for the audience to connect with them. The Flash is charismatic and inexperienced. The audience is rooted for him because this is his first real test as a superhero. Now, it's also worth noting that he's way less annoying in this movie than he was in Justice League. Like brunch, like what is brunch? Batman feels guilty for how he acted during Batman vs Superman, as he should because he's an absolute lunatic in that movie. <laughs> Sure. Aquaman is a grizzled surfer dude on the outside, but is really a sweetheart. We're asking a kid who just lost his father to go up against the most powerful machines in the universe. It's not fair. And Cyborg is maybe the best character in the whole movie. He has a tragic backstory involving the death of his mother and a satisfying character arc that gives him a noble purpose during the fight. Every member of the Justice League has something going for them. So when we see the slow-mo antics and stylized action Zack Snyder puts in the final act, we actually care about the characters involved. And everyone has a job to do. The Flash has to run as fast as possible to generate enough power for Cyborg to separate the mother boxes. Wonder Woman and Aquaman hold off Steppenwolf while Batman takes takes care of the parademons and plays quarterback. Now Superman has the least to do, showing up at the end of the fight to stop Steppenwolf. But I mean, this is justified by the narrative. This is also just a phenomenal action scene. The camera follows our heroes as they work their way through hordes of enemies. The Justice League pairs up to do attacks. <laughs> and has great chemistry. You're welcome, I'm man. You can feel the weight of the attacks. <laughs> and the gore only accentuates the action. <laughs> now sure, maybe if you're not a fan of Snyder's style or big CGI finales, you might not love the final battle of this movie on a technical level, but there's no denying that the character work throughout the movie and the chemistry of the team makes this a satisfying climax. And you can't say the same thing about the final 20 minutes of The Eternals. Now look, there's a lot to love in this movie, and it's not like, like Suicide Squad bad. What, we some kind of Suicide Squad? And the Oscar goes to... But there are glaring flaws that hold this movie back from reaching its potential. So let's set the scene so we can find out how the Eternals dropped the ball. You really dropped the ball, man. Shut up, Morty. The Eternals are sent to Earth by the Celestial Arisham to defeat the invasive deviants and look after humanity. Centuries pass and the Eternals grow apart until the deviants return. Concerned, our lead character Circe seeks to reunite the team, only to learn from Arisham that the Eternals' purpose was to ensure humanity grew large enough in numbers to fuel the birth of yet another Celestial. And now that the blip was reversed and the new Celestial is ready to emerge, the end of the world is upon us. Most of the Eternals don't want the Earth to end up like a building in a Michael Bay movie. But Icarus doesn't want to betray Arisham. He wants to let the Earth be destroyed so the Celestial can be born. So he kills Ajak when she suggests they stop the Emergence and attempts to stop the rest of the Eternals in their plan to prevent the Emergence from happening. That's right, folks, an alternate take on Superman and he's evil. Surprise, motherfucker. The battle commences on a beach and most of it consists of Icarus fighting the rest of the Eternals. First, he's distracted by Thena on the spaceship while the rest of the Eternals attempt to use Druig's power to control the Celestial. Once Icarus catches on, he stops their plan by attacking Druig. The Eternals now hold off Icarus while Cersei attempts to take care of the Celestial. These characters may be fighting each other, but are any of them in serious danger? Icarus doesn't really kill Ajak, he just didn't stop the Deviants who did. But I don't have to save you. For me, I was never worried that Icarus or Sprite was going to kill one of the other Eternals. Were you? Since most of the battle is these characters fighting each other and not like an external threat like a Celestial, the audience doesn't have a reason to be worried about the safety of these characters. There's no imminent danger besides the Celestial's slow emergence that's mostly cast to the sideline. Now, let's give credit where credit's due. The scene is technically incredible. The camera frames the action well and the fight choreography is entertaining. The effects are excellent and the punches feel like they hurt. From an action scene standpoint, Chloe Zhao hits all the right notes. 
The problem is, we don't care. Let me tell you, right, let me tell you <laughs> we don't care. Yeah. No matter how pleasing this battle might be to look at, it's hard to care about what's going on if we don't care about the people fighting. And that's perhaps the Eternal's biggest downfall characters. The final battle proves that the characters' motivations are flimsier than the plot of the sequel trilogy. Somehow Palpatine returned. The Emperor is dead. Dark science. Cloning. <laughs> Sprite changes her allegiance because she has a crush. Making such an immature decision contradicts the point she was trying to make to the other Eternals, that even though she may look like a child, she's a wise immortal being. I mean, I don't know about you, but betraying your family of centuries and destroying a planet because you have the hots for a bootleg Superman doesn't feel like something a wise immortal being would do. Kingo leaves before the climax because he claims that fighting would be against his quote unquote beliefs. This makes absolutely no sense. Out of all the Eternals, Kingo gained the most from being an earthling. So it stands to reason that he'd want to defend that Bollywood dynasty. I'm part of the greatest dynasty in the history of Bollywood. Now, Fastos is initially hesitant to join the battle to save Earth. His reasoning is that he wants to be there for his family. Who lives on Earth? What? You can also tell that the movie tries to present Icarus and his allies as sympathetic villains, but we as an audience are never going to sympathize with people who try to destroy the place we live. The decisions the characters make in The Eternals make about as much sense as time travel does in Endgame. Think about it. If you travel to the past, that past becomes your future, and your former present becomes the past. When you think of an immortal being making decisions, you think of like a, like a sage old man like Dumbledore, not Cheaty from The Good Place. I know I can be indecisive, but what's the harm in taking a few extra minutes to find the perfect? Unlike the Snyder Cut, the reasons these characters are fighting in the third act aren't believable or relatable to the audience. And if we don't care about them, we're not gonna care about why they're fighting. Another problem is that we don't know anything about most of these characters. Cersei, tell them about yourself. I can change a rock into water. Oh my god! Wow! Cersei is the main character of the movie. I dare you to name one character trait she has. Go ahead. I'm waiting. I mean, she likes people? Yeah, she likes people. That's great. That's the lowest bar you have to reach to qualify as a superhero. Now, a secondary antagonist is an evolved deviant who doesn't even have a name and shows up in the last 20 minutes of the movie to fight Thena. This deviant wants to kill the Eternals for killing all the deviants, but he also wants to stop the Celestials' emergence, but he also wants to destroy humanity. That's confusing. Exactly, Doug. Yes, it is confusing. There are so many characters in this movie that it's unreasonable to ask your audience to care about all of them. The movie would be no different if half of them weren't even in it. Kingo leaves the final battle before it starts is unnecessary, and Sprite's betrayal ultimately means absolutely nothing because everyone immediately forgives her for stabbing Cersei once she cries about how she felt left out. Now, Makari does find out where the emergence is, but before that, she spent 500 years as humanity's fastest hoarder. A lot of these characters are unnecessary to the story. Removing some of the characters' plot lines or focusing on them less would have given us more time to get to know Cersei and the other pivotal characters in the story. There's also an attempt in the climax to have scenes that bring the relationships of the movie to a roaring crescendo. Icarus Icarus doesn't kill Cersei because he loves her. Sprite and Icarus come to their senses through the power of family. Makari and Druig reunite as lovers once the day is saved. Now, if only the screenplay had put in the groundwork to make me care about any of that. I do not care. Beyond the writers constantly telling the audience these characters are a family, there's nothing done to show this connection. We don't care about the emotional weight of these scenes because the characters' relationships are not fleshed out at all. Except for Thena and Gilgamesh. That got me hard in the feels. Remember. <laughs> so, characters are supposed to be in love, but the movie forgets to show you why. Icarus and Circe are supposed to have been in a centuries-long relationship, but it feels more like a high school crush. Look, so cute. <laughs> The Snyder Cut has more chemistry in a team that just came together than a team that's supposed to have been together for centuries. The lack of well-developed characters, lack of emotional depth to their relationships, and the lack of clear-cut motivations makes the final battle of the Eternals fail before it even starts. We can only hope that the next iteration of the Eternals does a better job at achieving these ambitious goals that its predecessor failed to reach. And I just want to give everyone one last reminder to try out Game of Thrones Slot Casino with our link down in the description. But let me know your thoughts on the Eternals down in the comments below, or you can at me on Twitter. And if it's your first time here, please subscribe, smash that bell for alerts. For Screen Crush, I'm Ryan Airy.